But there's one they fear. In their tongue, he's Dovahkiin. Dragonborn. 2011, I think, has to be one of the biggest years we ever had in gaming. It saw the release of Batman Arkham City, Portal 2, Dark Souls, Deus Ex Human Revolution, and of course, Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. And to say the hype for Skyrim was huge is an understatement. The internet just wouldn't shut up about this thing leading up to its release. And when I saw all the promotional trailers and all that kind of stuff, I'm not gonna lie, it looked pretty damn good. You weren't just some random character anymore, you were the goddamn Dovahkiin, a legendary, prophesized dragon slaying warrior. So, you've got dragons, Nordic looking armor and locations, and Max von Sydow voicing a main character in the game, like sign me the hell up. The timing couldn't have been better either, it was slated for release November the 11th, 2011. 11, 11, 11. Then it came out, and in typical fashion, every man and his dog gave the game 8s and 9s out of 10. People on Reddit quickly made a cancerous meme from a throwaway line of dialogue that was about as annoying as the cake is a lie meme from Portal 2. It won a bunch of awards, sold millions of copies, and that kid you're friends with on Xbox Live said it's the bestest game ever. And like Oblivion before it, Skyrim was the kind of game I started playing and then just lost my grip on reality with. Like within the first couple of days, I think I'd probably sunk maybe 20 hours into it at least. Now look, Skyrim ain't bad, let's clear the air first and foremost, it's really not a bad game. But it sure as hell ain't a thinking man's RPG, and that's where some of the problems started. Still, it's got a bit of a love it or hate it kind of reputation, and has its good and bad points like every other game out there. So having said that, let's take a look at it then, shall we? Time for so set 200 years after the events in Oblivion, Skyrim takes place during the midst of a civil war. Between the Stormcloaks, a Nordic faction, and the Imperial Legion, a romantic group trying to remove Skyrim from the Septum Empire. An empire that's hundreds of years old and responsible for the stability and prosperity across Tamriel. Starting off as a prisoner believed to be in league with Ulfric Stormcloak, the player once again chooses their race, gender, and appearance before their execution is interrupted by the attack of a dragon. You soon find out you're someone that's known as a Dovahkiin, which literally translates to Dragonborn. And the story then deals with both the history of the dragons and the civil war that's raging across Skyrim. The outcome the player has direct control over. By Ismir, Irileth was right. At the heart of all of this is a super powerful dragon named Alduin, who's going around resurrecting his dragon buddies, and his ultimate goal is to ultimately just kind of take over the world. And learning the way of the Dovahkiin is the key to stopping him. So on the one hand, you've got Alduin, who's just like a clear-cut villain, whereas with the Imperials and the Stormcloak and the whole Civil War thing, it's kind of more down to who you choose to side with. Like, they've both got their good and bad sides. I mean, the Imperials just basically want to control the land and the people that's not even theirs to control. But the Stormcloaks are downright xenophobic and almost kind of racist at times, and they act like a bunch of misguided and violent rebels. Ah, uh, yes. In some ways, Skyrim does a pretty bang-up job of handling the concept of this civil war, with NPCs commenting on your political standings, and yet then, on the other hand, it often doesn't at times, with the player being able to walk freely throughout areas aligned with the opposite faction they sided with. Where it all goes to bollocks, though, is where the dialogue's concerned. Now, Skyrim always takes place from the perspective of the player. There's no cinematics or anything like that, so when something happens, you're always seeing it through the player's eyes. Then we understand each other. Good. What this just kind of boils down to though is what I've often referred to as talking heads, where an NPC just quite literally stands in one place, often in a neutral position with their arms by their side, delivering line after line of dialogue. It's often incredibly boring, monotone and drab stuff, in fact I'd argue it's even worse than Oblivion. I mean at least in Oblivion during dialogue, the camera was zoomed in on a character's face so you could see the subtle changes in their facial animation. Here though, it's zoomed out a lot more, so you can't even really notice any kind of shift in the way people are looking at you. And as a result, Skyrim feels kind of lazy sometimes when it's handling its story. Like, one of the biggest moments in the storyline is where you're taking place in this large meeting with both the Stormcloaks and the Imperials, who are putting aside their differences temporarily to deal with the dragon threat. But it's just a bunch of people sitting at a table for 15 minutes. It feels like you're watching like a boardroom meeting or something, more than it does a bunch of people squabbling like petty children over issues regarding the future and the safety of the world. Even when this conversation heats up, you'd expect someone to get out of their seat or maybe shout or something. But no, they all just sit there like mannequins. I have nothing to say to that murderer. Where Skyrim really shines though is when you can go off and make your own destiny and play your own story. 
The Thieves Guild and the Dark Brotherhood make a return, and once again, these are the highlights of the entire game. The Thieves Guild questline in particular is really lengthy, and one of the main leaders of the guild is actually voiced by Stephen Russell, who voiced Master Thief Garrett in the Thief series. Very clever. And of course, you can join the equivalent of the Mages and the Warriors Guild too, both of which have their own extensive quest lines. Talk to Codlack if you think you have what it takes to be a companion. One thing I do want to give praise to in Skyrim is the presentation, which is just leaps and bounds better than Oblivion. Having a much more Nordic feel to it than Oblivion, which just kind of felt like a pretty generic fantasy setting. Skyrim now features serene snow-capped mountains, there's frozen lakes, but also scenic rivers, cliff sides and forests. It's a downright gorgeous looking game at times in terms of the environments and there's just so many times where I'm playing where I just stop for a second to take the whole thing in. The attention to detail with the sound design during these moments is just kind of incredible as well. Whether it be the trickling of a nearby stream or the howling gale force winds on one of the game's many icy summits. I mean, it's just awesome stuff. Another improvement is the character models. Now, NPCs no longer look like they've got facial deformities and they look more like real people. There's noticeable physical differences between all of the races, so you can easily distinguish the difference between, say, a dark elf and a high elf. Problem is, the engine is downright broken if you try to play it at a higher frame rate than 60. And if you try to play it when it's higher than that, well, then you're gonna see some serious shit. Ow! Jeremy Soule's also back to compose the music. I mean, at this point, it'd be a crime if he didn't come back. It'd be like a Christopher Nolan film not having Hans Zimmer. Standing on the top of a mountain or moving through some random forest and then realizing you've got this stunning orchestral underscore just really helps immerse you in the game world. What Skyrim has done again like Oblivion is try and let the player's experience be catered around their personal playstyle. But the way Skyrim differs is that it's done away with major and minor skills entirely. What they've tried to do to rectify this is something called Standing Stones. Now these are monuments you find at the start of the game, and the first three you'll come across is the Thief, Warrior, and the Mage Stone. Picking one of these stones is going to make it easier to level up that relevant skill tree. So if I picked a Thief for instance, I'm going to be able to level up my Sneaking faster than I could my Heavy Armor. In Oblivion, what you'd instead do was choose one of these classes at the beginning of the game, of which I think it had like 20 or so. And then this would decide what your major skill is going to be. So if you're playing a warrior, it was going to be heavy armor, block, blade weapons, and things of that nature. But in Skyrim, every skill is technically a major skill. So if you're trying to be that thief character, you're still going to get experience points towards your next level if you play around in alchemy or enchanting. Now look, it sounds good on paper, but in actuality, it's even worse than before. Because now you can progress to the next level with random points put into side skills you probably have no intention of ever using. I feel like they should almost distinguish the non-combat and combat related skills entirely so non-combat skills don't affect the way combat scales and vice versa. The other thing is that the points you earn for a skill aren't going to improve it alone, you then have to spend the skill points you earn from leveling up into a skill tree first. You could have 80 points in sneaking, for instance, but if you haven't spent actual skill points into that tree to improve its effectiveness, it's not gonna do jack shit. Combat skills have been streamlined as well, so now there's either just one-handed or two-handed weapons. And then of course you've got archery for bows. There's no more hand-to-hand, -hand, blade or blunt weapons. Acrobatics and athletics are removed entirely. Gone are the days of jumping across rooftops like some fleet-footed cat burglar. Now you're just stuck on the ground with the rest of the losers in Tamriel. How boring. About the only thing that's been kept relatively intact is the magic trees, with alteration, conjuration, destruction, etc. still functioning mostly the same as before. Sadly though, the melee combat system, just like Oblivion before it, just often feels like hot garbage. Maybe you can forgive Oblivion for the time it came out, but I mean now in 2011 when Skyrim was released, this whole thing just felt really dated. I'm still kind of genuinely amazed at how much time and effort has been put into certain aspects of Skyrim's mechanics, and yet how a lot of it is still just the absolute bare bones needed to scrape by. And there's no better example of this than when engaging in melee combat. Victory is yours. Regardless of the weapon you're using, you've got a standard and a heavy attack, and then of course you can block, but there's still no kind of parry system. There's not even any kind of dodge move, and about all you can do is swing like a madman and hope that your damage output and your health points are higher than whatever you're fighting. The spell system has at least been improved to an extent, like spells now actually look like the element they're supposed to be. In Skyrim, a fire spell looks like fire. The lightning looks like lightning. The schnozberries taste like schnozberries. 
What's also pretty neat now is how you can choose to have the weapons or spells in your left or right hand, with the spells or attacks being activated by the left or right mouse button. And this actually works pretty well for the most part, giving a fairly high level of customization to the player in terms of how they want to handle combat. Like have a lightning spell in your right hand and a healing spell in your left hand, or maybe an axe in your right hand and a fire spell in the left. As Captain Planet used to say, the power is yours. And utilizing your favorites menu to snap back and forth between loadouts is pretty seamless. This I think is probably the best new addition to the combat, and it makes a spell sword build extremely fun. Magicka also regenerates much quicker in Skyrim than it did in Oblivion, so actively searching for gear that increases your regeneration rate can make combat much faster and mean that there's less downtime. And you're also less reliant on having to pop those magical mana or health potions all the time as well. Thing is, the balancing, again, is all over the place. Seems you go from one extreme to the other, you're either struggling to stay alive against enemies or absolutely obliterating them. And again, all the difficulty modes do is increase the enemy's health points. Though at least now they're clearly defined difficulty modes and not just some ambiguous slider. Like Oblivion before, the stealth builds are still kind of laughably easy, especially once you get to a certain point because you just pretty much become invisible to enemies. And those problems with the balancing don't affect stealth builds quite as much because you're probably going to be avoiding most enemies anyway. The fix to this is dabbling around with the smithing and enchanting, which can quite literally break the game and allow you to create gear that can just destroy anything you come up against. Simply maxing out smithing is powerful enough as it is, but with enchanting you can create gear that fortifies smithing, which makes it even more broken. The trick is that once you've decided what kind of weapon you're using, you can fortify all of your gear for that specific category, making that weapon group extremely powerful. And the kind of gear you can create through this system pretty much shits over anything you're going to find in the game normally. Maybe that's all for the best though, like considering you're supposed to be playing as this prophetic harbinger, saving Tamriel from this ever increasing dragon threat. At the heart of Skyrim is the theme of this player being the dragonborn, and seemingly at random and often with hilariously bad timing, you'll have a dragon appear in the sky and start attacking you. Beating dragons is essential for earning dragon souls to unlock more dragon shouts, and also because dragons drop scales and bones, which you can then use to craft dragon armor, which is some of the best in the game. Dragon attacks aren't always convenient, not that I think a dragon attack ever would be, but sometimes when it happens it can mess up the gameplay, and I don't even think it's possible to run away from these things, even if you're trying to get away on a horse. So at one point you'll have to start fighting them. Fighting dragons is fun at first, but then it just becomes kind of tedious. You only ever need to do it to unlock more shouts and if you want to craft dragon armor, but once you've unlocked everything you want, there's no real purpose to it. Dragon Rend is a shout you get about halfway through the game which forces a dragon to land, making it even easier to kill them, which I think is the most useful one of these by far. And after this, the dragon fights are just a mere nuisance. Fusrodar is the main dragon shout which got marketed out of the arse around the time of the game's release and look I won't lie this thing is pretty fucking badass. Fus but it's really just a knockback attack which stronger enemies can resist anyway. But all it's good for is knocking someone off a cliff for shits and giggles. Outside of fighting dragons, Skyrim at least does a pretty good job of keeping things varied. You'll be taking on bandits, mud crabs, wolves and other innocent wildlife that just happen to be minding their own business until you walked on by. If it's not something that just runs right up to you and tries to sit on your face, then it's something that hangs back with some kind of ranged weapon. One of the main enemies you're fighting in Skyrim are the Draugr, who you encounter in I think literally every single dungeon in the game. And these are these undead warriors brought back to life who are in absolute abundance and super pissed off. Basically they just function mostly the same in terms of fighting bandit type enemies. They're either using a melee weapon or a bow, but the occasional one knows how to use a basic dragon shout. <laughs> Hope you're not an arachnophobe either because Skyrim has some of the most horrifying looking spiders in any video game. One of the first quests in the game has you fighting this giant bastard that just drops out of the ceiling. And I actually screamed like a little bitch when it first happened. I mean, I live in Australia, we invented spiders and this thing still scared me. There's just something about the way they scuttle around and the fact you're often fighting them in caves which means you can't run away makes it just even more frightening. These things still make me break out in a cold sweat, alongside the spiders in Dark Messiah of Might and Magic and the trites in Doom 3. There's actually a mod that someone made that replaces all of them with bears instead, and I have to say that's not a bad mod to install, along with the one that lets me have sex with a high elf. 
Sadly though, there's not all that much variety to the dungeons, and like Oblivion, they all fall into a couple of main categories. Usually either tombs, caves, forts, or mines. Sometimes an area might back onto some kind of dwarven ruin, but most of them just follow the same archetype. And once you've done a few of these dungeons, you'll feel like you've done them a couple of dozen times. The allure in Skyrim is supposed to be exploring all these dungeons and finding dragon shouts at the end of these tombs. But considering, like I said, most of the shouts aren't all that useful, it's not always worth the time, outside of just checking them for curiosity sakes. Well that was fucking dreadful. Getting lost in dungeons is also pretty much impossible. You're always just walking in a mostly single direction. Sometimes flipping a switch or solving a puzzle, where the solution is literally in the same room. And once you've finished a dungeon, there's always a shortcut that loops you right back to the start. And I think a lot of the real problems in Skyrim stem from it just being too forgiving to the player in so many ways. You can rise to the top ranks of both the Mages Guild and the Thieves Guild on a single character, despite not necessarily having skills in either field. In fact, you could probably join and rise to the ranks at the top of every single guild and faction in the entire game in one playthrough. And I don't fucking care if there's some kind of mod that fixes this. I don't. I hate when people use that as a defense. Games, I think, should be evaluated on how they play out of the box. I mean, some mod that some guy made that adds all this kind of stuff back in doesn't excuse the fact that it wasn't there to begin with. The modding scene from Oblivion is really responsible for introducing modding as a viable way of improving the fundamental flaws of a game. And this is also something that ended up being the case with Skyrim. And yeah, with mods you can make Skyrim to be a pretty damn polished and fun game, but that doesn't excuse the base problems it has. Oh, you may have a point. Anyway, I doubt there's going to be a mod out there that fixes this animation. I mean, just look at it. And on that note, Skyrim wasn't without its fair share of bugs. On launch, you could even permanently break save files. I had the game on both the PS3 and PC because my PC at the time was a goddamn toaster. And on the PS3 version, I'd played for a certain amount of time. In my case, it was about 60 hours. And then at that point, it seemed the PS3 just couldn't process all the information and my save file would either crash or just lag horribly. With recent titles like Fallout 76 and other games like Anthem, we've seen that gamers are no longer putting up with this kind of shit. And I think we're at a crossroads where developers just aren't getting away with being lazy anymore. And it would have been interesting to see if Skyrim got released in the current year with some of the problems it had on launch. If it still would have got the glowing response it had back in 2011, or instead been the target of countless outrage culture videos on YouTube instead. I tried to tell them, they wouldn't listen. Thankfully playing Skyrim in our current year is easy as piss due to it still being highly accessible and somewhat still supported. And there's so many versions of the game out there. Obviously there was the PC, the PS3 and the Xbox 360 version, but it also got a remastered version for the PS4 and the Xbox One, which also got released on Microsoft Windows. Not to mention a port for the Nintendo Switch and even Skyrim VR, which gives you something else to swing a sword at aside from your virtual girlfriend. Again, like Oblivion, I could feel like there's just so much stuff I could keep talking about and I could make an hour long video and still probably not cover everything. You can get married, you can buy a house, you can adopt a kid, there's all the DLC to cover. There's just a veritable shitload of stuff to do. If you made it through all that, you're likely worth something to me. People have made videos that go for hours about how bad it is or how good it is. That's your best, huh? But I think one thing is certain, and that's how it's earned its stripes and still remained a favorite over all the years among certain gamers. I mean, yeah, it's not a perfect game, but does a perfect game even exist? And a game where you can shout so goddamn loud that you can force a dragon to land is always going to be badass on some level. <laughs>